My question was, if they were to pull off an improbable victory, I don't with think three Sean straight Payton, division games, then what? I don't think Peyton has the relationship with Doug Peterson. That what are you Belichick, talking about? They went golfing together. McMullen, the Eagles get to wear green jerseys well, this game because he of beat a Peyton. Bet, of a bet, but that's not the same relationship as, hey, everybody, is a, everybody in the world is against Chip Kelly. I had Chip here in practice. Let me throw him a bone and hand him get a victory. Get out of here. You're Broussard all of a sudden. <laughs> That's a, Set this man straight, McMullen, will you? Well, no, I, I can't. Doug and Sean love each other, so that's that's a man. But he's not going to hand him the game at this point of the season. Oh, no, no, he's not going to hand him the game. <laughs> but I don't think Bill handed uh, Chip the game unless he felt sorry for him. So there's no knows, way anybody's but, handed people games. I'm telling you, By he the felt way, sorry if, for him. If, Belichick, if, if there's anybody can get away it, with it. Yeah. If you want to look at it in one way, Doug <laughs> Peterson can't lose to Sean Pate. He beats him on the golf course, so maybe he beats him on the football field and pulls something out. The only thing I can point to is Teron Armstead's not going to play. He might be the best left tackle in football. Maybe that hurts him offensively. Uh, but, yeah, on paper it doesn't look good, let's be honest. No, and uh, the one thing is, you know, if the Eagles had won eight games in a row, a la the Saints, that feeling of, well, you can't win nine in a row. You just don't have it one week. That's normal in the NFL. The p possibility that this is that one week. What would some of the things, John, ha what would some of the things have to happen? What would some of the, <laughs> what would be some of the things that would have to happen for that to occur? Where you would say, I could see the Eagles doing this, this, and this, and that giving the Saints some problems. Well, they got to score. So they got to figure out a way to go from 21st in the league in scoring, which is what they are this year, uh, to third in the league, which is what they were last season. And the only difference, there is no difference between yardage, as Doug explained, explosive plays. Everything's the same, except they're not scoring. Uh, and if you look at Carson's numbers, I don't know, his passer rating's like 108. Zach Ertz is setting records every week. I mean, they put up pretty impressive numbers, but it doesn't result in scoring plays. So it doesn't sort of matter. If they can figure out how to get that red zone success, if they can get a turnover, uh, maybe that changes games. Maybe a special teams play. They need something in that realm, whether it's special teams, whether it's a turnover, uh, the defense well, scores, or at least puts up a short field for the offense, something of that. And, and we had Steve Spagnola on before, and he actually said that, like, sometimes it's the, the turnovers, they don't come, and then they come in bunches. There's no rhyme or reason. We get asked all the time as coordinators, why aren't you getting turnovers? There is no answer. They just come or they don't, and sometimes when they come, they come in bunches. Yeah, that's true. That is true. But with this quarterback – it is more difficult. I mean, his touchdown interception ratio is 22 to 1. Uh, he's taken nine sacks on the year because he gets rid of the football. So, this more than most weeks is more difficult. And I saw people on Twitter saying, bring Steve Spagnola back and fire <laughs> Jim Swartz. I mean, I, I like Steve, but Steve is the architect of two of the five worst defenses in NFL history. Uh, one in New York, one in New Orleans. Yeah, I think he was a blitz guy. That's why right. the Eagle fans like him. Yeah, well, we know I, I, Eagles fans like the blitz until Corey Davis catches the winning touchdown uh, in overtime. Until Deshaun Jackson uh, burns them on the first play. Until Adam Seelan's going for seventy plus yards. The blitz giveth, the blitz taketh away. Alvin Kamara is going to kill this team. Somebody, yeah, he is. So, somebody is going to no. die uh, as far as maybe their career. Like Ronald Darby no. got hurt being out routed last week. I don't even know what's going to happen this week with Kamara on the open field, John. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, if you look around this league as a whole, yeah. there is an issue with teams. Uh, dealing with guys and catch the football out of the backfield. And he does it better than anybody else, uh, Kamara. 
and the Eagles specifically have been really bad with those running backs in the flat routes. Uh, so this is not, as we talked about, this is not the best matchup in the world because they have the best back in the league at doing it, and they haven't proved they can stop it. Uh, so maybe maybe they spend some extra time on it, but, man, that guy is dynamic, and uh, he, he can beat you a lot of ways. Hey, one of the things Spags brought up with us was it's okay to lose guys to injury if it's one guy here, a guy there. But he did acknowledge that it's almost overwhel- too much to overcome when it all is in one concentrated area, a la the secondary here. So give us an update on what this secondary could look like this week. Well, Sidney Jones was back in practice today, as expected, in a limited fashion. But he said last week, uh, and Doug kind of intimated today, they expect him to play. So ultimately, I think what's going to happen is Jalen Mills is going to miss another week. Obviously, you just mentioned Ronald Darby uh, is gone for the year. I, I think they're going to let Sidney Jones play on the outside at, along with Rasul Douglas and then have Avante Maddox play in the slot. Now, the only question is, do they want Avante to play safety? I think Corey Graham in the second week back, they'll lean on him in that second safety spot. Uh, if they don't, they could sort of shovel Maddox safety in the base defense and put him in nickel, uh, put him in the slot in nickel. But I don't think they want moving parts. You just mentioned how everybody wants to blitz. Everybody wants to be aggressive, especially against this team. Look, you don't have your two best cornerbacks. You don't have Rodney McLeod. Fortunately, you're getting Sidney Jones back. Last week, they didn't have him. That's four out of your top five uh, defensive backs in your nickel defense are not on the field, and people want Jim Swartz to blitz? I mean, that's that's insanity. Or they want him fired. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even want you to blitz. Right. I just, you're Forget right. it. We've had enough. Just fire the guy. Well, I got. I, I you know what? You should fire him if he blitzes with Rasul Douglas and Chandon Sullivan and Avante Maddox on the field. You should fire him. Yeah, because this, that's that's a recipe for disaster. This Chandon Sullivan is a hero of mine. He made it on an NFL <laughs> roster, played in a game, and no one had ever heard of him. <laughs> well, I had heard of him. But you just weren't listening to me. Uh, he he had been on the practice squad. He had a good training camp. Uh, the Eagles liked him. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, he's an undrafted rookie out of Georgia State. This is not, uh, a, a you know, a top ten pick in the draft. This is a guy who uh, is supposed to be a, a deep roster player at this stage of his career, a special teamer, and he's forced out on the field. It's a difficult circumstance. And what Spag said is true. I also mentioned that. The difference between the injuries this year and last year is that they piled up at particular positions. On offense, it's been receiver. On defense, it's been the secondary. Whereas last year, you had key injuries, but they were all over the place. One left tackle, one middle linebacker, one quarterback, one special teams guy, one running back. They were all over the roster. Here, you've got to go deeper and deeper and deeper to certain positions, and that's difficult to do. Do you think that the relationship that Carson Wentz and Zach Ertz have developed on the field, and bear with me here, has almost developed into it to a detriment to other people, maybe Alshon Jeffrey, and I use terms like maybe, to where there just seems to be almost, and and I'm deferring to you, John, but it seems to be almost resistance to go through progressions and hit other people, not just Wendell Small would open in the backfield, but others now, it seems like it's trickling down. But I, I wouldn't say that if the team's 5-3 and three and Zach Ertz is having the same season. Well, I mean, I, I've asked that question a lot, and I agree with you because this uh, offense has, has it, when it's been at its best, it's when the football is going around in multiple pieces uh, and not just, uh, two guys. I wouldn't put Jeffrey in that code category because it's been since he's come back, it's been all Zach Ertz, all, all Sean Jeffrey. Those are the only two guys uh, they're looking for in key situations. Last week, it was, you know, 
it, it's very effective. I mean, Carson targeted Zach Ertz 16 times. He caught it 14 times. So, you know, let's use New Orleans as an example. They do the same thing with Michael Thomas because they don't have other receivers. Uh, and it's been they've been able to win football games. Now they have guys coming out of the backfield. Uh, ben Watson is better than people think. But uh, th- at times they've gotten very Michael Thomas-centric and still won games. So, I, I mean, I see your point. I brought it up myself. I think it's a valid point. I think they should move the football around. But it's hard to argue when you're 14 out of 16 that it's not working. I, I don't think that was the issue, uh, getting the football to Earth that much. And, you know, you bring up that small wood play. I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, er- everybody who's got a couple hundred dollars – can get game pass now and can look at all 22 sure. film. But what they don't realize is there, and you mentioned there are progressions on particular plays. So in a certain system, when you have an outlet receiver like that, that might be Carson Wentz fourth progression designed on the play. Uh, there was a big play with Joe Flacco where Lamar Jackson was on the field at the same time and everybody's, putting the clip up and he's wide open and nobody's paying attention to him. He's probably the fourth or fifth progression on that play. So why would Joe Flacco be automatically looking at Lamar Jackson? Why would Carson Wentz be automatically looking at Wendell Smallwood? That's not where the play is designed to go. That's the part where people that, that, that sort of do this and, and envision themselves as U2 scouts, don't understand, they don't get to talk to the players, they don't get to talk to the coaches. The play is designed to go in a different direction. It, again, it's not a video game. right? So it's not, oh, you see a big glaring Wendell Smallwood is wide open. You're, you're focused on Alshon Jeffrey on that play, and then you go to your second progression, third, maybe your fourth, if there's enough time. There's rarely enough time. Talking with John McMullen at JF McMullen on Twitter here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. You wrote about today, Mike Grow. We asked Spags about new coaches and guys, you know, bringing them in, and he, he admitted, like, yeah, that that's you know sometimes uh, that is a little bit of an adjustment here. You asked if he's set to be the scapegoat here in Philadelphia, and Aton, you brought up earlier, is somebody going to yeah. be the fall guy for this season if they don't make the playoffs, which seems unlikely right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think he's going to be the scapegoat. I really do. It's it's the obvious one. If you don't sort of peel back the onion, it's the one you could point to and say, well, what's the – we talked about the yardage being piled up. We just talked about Carson Wentz's numbers being better than ever before. Zach Ertz is having historic numbers. Alshon Jeffrey's been very effective. But they don't score. Uh, and what's the difference? The most glaring difference is Frank Reich is gone and, and Mike Crow was inserted and John filippo has gone as well. And he would have gotten that job if he wanted it. Uh, so you're down to your third guy. And I, as I said last year, if you want to look at last year's coaching staff and you would rank the, the, the assistant coaches on the offensive side, Mike would have also been behind – Deuce Staley and Jeff Stout, and he jumped over those guys because of his background. He was a quarterback in college. He was a coordinator under his dad in college. So Doug thought he had the opportunity to be the better coordinator because of his background. Uh, It's an easy scapegoat. I don't think it's his fault. Uh, Doug is the play caller. No one will – talk and be above board about how much uh, uh, effect Mike has on uh, the game plan, I'm pretty sure it's not as much as Frank Wright did. So if anything, it would be less his fault, right? and it would be more on Doug's shoulders. But Doug's not going anywhere, so if you're going to scape, so, scapegoat somebody, it's going to be Mike Groh. All right, you used the operative word here, if, and I think in years past... We have seen the Eagles react like bad organizations do, where if you have a year or two going well and you take a step back, you panic. Somebody has to go. Somebody has to be fired. But And, and we've had this conversation earlier in the show, I think, with, with Spags as well. But just to get your thoughts on this, John, 
you've seen the NFL work. You've seen teams that are successful, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, clearly the big one up in New England, others as well, where you have two years in a row in which you're good, you take a step back, and you don't panic. Somebody might leave because they have a job opportunity, but you don't panic. Why panic this year? Yeah, and I'm not saying they're necessarily going to panic. Right, and it right. might be more in the direction of what you just said, say, you know what? Uh, might go out and get another job, go out and go in a different direction, might not be an outward firing or something of that nature. And Press Taylor would be in that conversation as well. Maybe they get opportunities to go in another direction. A couple of years ago when John Filippo, for example, uh, had an opportunity to be the offense coordinator with the Jets, he was under contract. The Eagles blocked him it, it, because they respected him and they liked him that much and wanted him in the organization. If they were to get other job offers, I'm not sure they would block them. That, that I think, would be the difference. I don't think necessarily they're going to go out and just fire him. In fact, I would think Doug would lean in the other direction. He wouldn't want to do that because he doesn't want to be somebody portrayed as panicking and saying, I'm blaming these guys. I'm throwing them under the bus. I could see it going in that direction just because of the city we're in. Uh, you, you've, you've just talked about people calling for Jim Schwartz's job, uh, who I say consistently is a top five defensive coordinator in this league. Uh, nothing against Steve Spagnuolo, but you really want to compare the resume of those two? It's not close. So, uh, you know, people overreact. Uh, we're talking with John McMullen here. Of course, the Eagles getting ready for uh, the Saints and uh, tough time. Uh, Richard Rodgers is back. Uh, possibility for Jernigan. Uh, what do we got going on there? Yeah, I mean, I, it's pretty clear Richard Rodgers is is going to be uh, activated at some point. I think he's going to play. Uh, Doug said Josh Perkins hurt his knee, so uh, there's an easy roster move. You just put Josh on injured reserve. Richard takes his spot. I, I think the bigger question is Jernigan. He seems to be getting closer. Uh, he seems to be moving well. Uh, the Eagles obviously need a boost. I think they're hopeful in the field this weekend. Uh, if they're able to get him on the field, He'll probably take Ronald Darby's spot, who is yet to be put on injured reserve, but he will be. So I think there's a chance Tim plays this week. Richard Rodgers is going to play. Um, and he's here primarily to add some what, what blocking back? Does that mean we might see them run the ball a little bit? Well, I, I mean, he, he can catch it. He's, he's not the yeah, most no. athletic guy, but – he, he's he would be the of third. He would be the third pass catching option, right? At that yeah, position, at, at tight, yeah. At that particular position, he would be the number one blocking option. Now, and, and he's not a great blocker by any stretch of the imagination, but he's competent. Uh, and and I've been talking about that all year. The Eagles did not have a tight end who could block uh, a lick. I mean, you see Zach Ertz for all of his. You, you can't throw enough accolades at him as a receiver. It's the exact opposite as a blocker. Uh, he's not good. You saw him with the, the first offensive play of the game. They have him chipping Demarcus Lawrence for some reason. That's one of the biggest mismatches in the world. Right now, their best blocking tight end before Richard rejoins and is Dallas Goddard, who wasn't even asked to do it at college. in college. But he's a big kid, and he's willing to do it. Josh Perkins... Before he got hurt, he was a receiver in college. He's not a blocker. Uh, so Richard Rodgers is a big guy, 6'4", 250, and he can at least play in line and, and give you a little more. It's not sexy, but it's important to any offense. John, I was surprised looking at a bunch of clips, and some of them surfaced online, just some that I saw from people sending just how often it looks like Vitae needs help from a pass from a, a route runner, tight end, somebody on the side of him. And I wonder, A, if you're seeing that, and B, if you are. I mean, that pretty much is a pretty damning statement for a guy who has a lot of expectations if Jason Peters and even Lane Johnson are dealing with stuff moving forward. 
Yeah, it's interesting. They did give him a lot of help. I think part of it is because Lawrence was lined up against him, and he's one of the better edge rushers in this league. But then again, you look to this week, and it, it, it's Cameron Jordan, right. who's also in that category. Uh, now, spot. they're hopeful that Lane Johnson will play. They thought he was going to play last week, and he was a late scratch. He was uh, practicing in a limited fashion. So, I would think that he would be back and you don't have to worry about it. But, yeah, I mean, when – especially on the right side, and it's weird to say, usually if you can play left tackle, you can play right tackle. But for whatever reason, Baitai is more comfortable uh, on the left side uh, and they feel they have to give him more help. Uh, and certainly against players like Lawrence and, and Jordan, uh, they would have those guys chipping. But that's what you have to do in this league. Every, you know, the Saints are going to be without Teron Armstead, and they're going to have a 34-year-old backup. They're going to have to chip because uh, Michael Bennett's going to be there the majority of the game, and they're going to have some issues. Plenty more on this game. Uh, kind of a, a do-or-die type of situation for the Eagles. John McMullen here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. He's back tomorrow with all the news from Nova Care, And then, of course, Friday we'll get you ready for the Eagles and the Saints. Thanks, pal. Hey, thanks, guys.